Welcome to I'm Spiritual, Damn It. I'm your host, Jennifer Weigel, and joining me on the phone, Dr. Judith Orloff. Judith, uh, Judith's latest book, The Empath's Survival Guide, is a page turner for anybody who knows themselves to be empathic. She is also an empath, and she's on the UCLA Psychiatric Clinical Faculty. Uh, she has, oh, many best selling books. Let's roll some of them off here. New York Times bestsellers include Emotional Freedom, The Power of Surrender, Second Sight, Positive Energy. And Guide to Intuitive Healing. You can connect with Judith on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, I'm very grateful to have her on the phone with me today. Hello, Judith. Hello, Jan. I'm so happy that this book is, I hope, taking off the way it should. Because there are so many people out there in this very tumultuous time that are absorbing all of the events going on in the world, even globally, not next door. We are feeling the energy that's happening. Explain that phenomenon, Judith, because with your history of science, and you are an MD, but yes, you are an intuitive and an empath, there are more people out there who are empathic, and they just don't know it. Isn't that the case? Oh, there are so many empaths out there. I just got back from my book tour, and there are so many people struggling with absorbing the energy of what's going on in the world and also with the energy vampires and draining people around them into their own bodies. An empath is an emotional sponge and a physical sponge sometimes where we actually take on the energy and the emotions and physical symptoms of other people. And so unless empaths really learn strategies not to do that, it's not a healthy thing to do that with with negative occurrences or emotions, then they can just be wiped out. And what I've been noticing also is that even non-empaths are becoming empaths in this high-stress world environment Mm -hmm. because they simply don't have the defenses to save themselves from the stress. And so their defenses are being beaten down, and so non-empaths are becoming empaths and don't know how to cope. You know, I found it so fascinating when I first came across your your book, Positive Energy. That is what introduced me to the concept of the energy vampire. And these are the people that suck the life out of you. They literally, when you're around them, you feel drained, you feel tired, you feel sad. You sort of take on some of their emotions. You're like, gosh, why, why am I in such a bad mood? But people don't realize it is possible to absorb the emotions of another if you are not consciously protecting yourself. So how can people walking around today in all of this angst protect themselves? Well, I think the first thing is if you think you're an empath, take the self-assessment test in the beginning of the empath survival guide to Mm -hmm. self-diagnose. Yeah. Because it's really an aha realization to learn that you're an empath. If you're exhausted, if you're anxious, if you're depressed and you don't know why or or you haven't been able to really find a solution, it could be that being an empath is a missing piece to your growth and evolution. Okay. That's what I've been seeing. And so first, you know, see if you identify as being an empath. Empaths are very high on the empathic spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the highest. And regular empathy is kind of in the middle where you feel for somebody else but you don't absorb. Mm -hmm. And the lowest on the spectrum are the narcissists who have empathy deficient disorder who don't really have empathy as we know it. Right. So empaths are way high up, and so you need to know if you are one. And once you are, you can take the proper steps to protect yourself and to, you know, really thrive. Because what I'm suggesting is that empaths, we need empaths more than ever now. Right. We need empathic, sensitive, loving people to come out and not be just so vulnerable to stress they can't be the heroes of our culture and our world. You know, they really need to, and what I want to support them doing is to feel strength from their sensitivities and learn how not to take on the negative stuff. That's the key. That's the big missing element that people don't know. So the first thing is identify yourself as an empath And what kind of empath are you? Are you an emotional empath? I talk about three types in the book. Mm -hmm. Emotional empath, somebody who takes on more of the emotions and stress of others. Um, Are you a physical empath? Do you literally take on the physical symptoms of somebody else? Mm -hmm. If you're around somebody who's nauseated, do you start to feel nauseated? Right. It literally can go right into your own body if you're a physical empath. 
And that really clouds the medical picture if you're a physical empath undiagnosed. Right. And no, can't make any heads or tails out of what's going on with you. Mm-hmm. Or are you an intuitive empath? You know, somebody who is really in touch with their intuition and can feel and empathize with, let's say, animals. It's an animal empath, a communion, or an earth empath, somebody who really is attuned to the earth's changes and the, the deep well of wisdom in the earth. Or are you a telepathic empath? You know, can you actually feel so deeply into somebody intuitively that you can know what they're feeling and thinking? Is it possible to be all of these things, Judith? Sure. It's okay. possible to be all of these things. And what I encourage people to do when they're reading the book is just to see which one you identify with. No stress, no strain. Don't try to fit yourself into a category. It's not about that. It's just about... What do you do naturally? What did you do as a child maybe that you blocked off and squashed? Because that's very common with empaths because I write about how as an empath child I had no support and I can't overemphasize what an effect that had on me. Right. So you, your doctors are medical doctor. You know, your parents are MDs, MDs yes. to the stars in Hollywood, and they just didn't really want to talk about this at the dinner table. <laughs> well, not only that, they told me to get a thicker skin. Right. Which is horrible because it made me feel like there was something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And they had no way to help me ground, center, or acknowledge that what I was feeling was real. Right. And so I always felt like there was something defective in me or wrong with me, which isn't so. Right. And many empaths feel that way as children because they're not given the adequate support. That's why I feel so strongly about empaths coming out of the closet, the parents, the children, and giving the children the adequate support now so they grow up and feel that it's a natural, beautiful thing. It's a strength, and a lot of people will think of something with a sensitivity as a weakness, and that's old wiring. And and truly, if you embrace all of these things that you're talking about and these intuitive abilities, it's an absolute strength and can be very empowering for the person who diagnoses themselves or finds themselves as an empath. And for you and your work, Judith, I, I wonder, because you are an MD and you do have the scientific background, to somebody who's listening to this without the understanding of intuition, the way that you have it from having lived it, uh, what can you explain to them that's happening in the brain to be able to tap into somebody else's physical pain? I mean, by and large, I have a friend who just told me this story that he had his father's heart attack. His father died of a heart attack and he felt it. He felt it go through his arm and he literally had to take a cab, go home, lay on the couch and was 26 years old, healthy as a horse, didn't understand what was going on. Then he gets the call later, your father died of a heart attack. So he felt his father's heart attack. How do you explain that scientifically to someone who doesn't really understand energy and that we're all connected? Right. Well, there's a section in the book on the science of empaths and empathy. Mm -hmm. And one really interesting element of it is that it's believed that the mirror neuron system, which is uh, the neurons, which are the neurons responsible for compassion, are hyperactive in empaths, meaning their compassion and their empathy is cranked way up. Mm -hmm. And so they have abilities way beyond, you know, the, the midline or average. And so they're able to sense and know and even merge with other people to feel their own pain. The mirror neurons, we haven't studied them enough, although thank God we have information on them. You know, the potent neurotransmitters in the brain that allow us to feel so deeply. So that's one element of it. Another is explained. The HeartMath Institute does wonderful research on the electromagnetic fields in the body and how these transmit information, the electromagnetic field around the heart or around the brain, that empaths and sensitive people can actually feel what's going on in other people via this energy. Right. And so there are all kinds of ways our body transmits, which conventional medicine doesn't know about. Mm -hmm. And therefore, empaths really have a hard time in the conventional medical system because conventional medicine doesn't have the context to translate the science yet into how to treat an empath in the right way. 
Exactly. And so one of the things, I have a son who's an empath. And when he was real little, he would sense when I was in danger. I mean, I was honestly traveling for work and he, he shot up in bed and said to his father, call mom, she's in trouble. And sure enough, I was in this really dark area of traveling and walking and it was dangerous and I, I, I was fine. But he picked up on that. And so uh, we've done a lot of research and thanks to your book, Judith, I feel it's helping him every day to understand that this is something that he has that is a gift. It's not a problem or it's an ability. It's not a negative thing and it won't hinder his ability to interact with others if we learn more how to use it. But, you know, for for us, we say to other people who can't get this, imagine like you're looking in a car next to you and the windows are up or the windows are down, but you can see through the windows. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like an empath. They can see through other people's windows, but the people who don't have that skill, that window is shaded and they can't see through. So they can't react to the person inside if they're laughing or smiling or crying because they can't see through it. Does that help at all? Or do you have any other better examples to help people who don't understand uh, the phenomenon of being an empath? just grasp yeah, I like it. that that's that's really a nice image mm-hmm. um but also you know a lot of people aren't empaths and there's nothing wrong with that right. i just wrote the empath survival guide for the empaths and everyone who loves them to try and understand them but you know for instance my partner is not an empath he doesn't sense anything that's going on in other people's body <laughs> It's the last thing he wants to do, nor is he capable of it. Right, right. And I know many people who are not as well, but if you know somebody in your circle, in your family, who is, it, it's better to just kind of wrap your head around it to know, oh, that's why you're always asking me, are you okay? What's bothering you? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so if, what the problem is, the non-empaths expect empaths to respond like them, and mm-hmm. they don't. So if you're if you have a spouse that's an empath, if you have children, if you have coworkers, you can understand them better. Even if you aren't an empath, let's say you can't relate to this at all. You're around people, you don't pick up anything. Right. You just talk to them. Mm-hmm. So that like my partner says, I'm just I'm not feeling anything. Right. You know, I'm like just talking to somebody, and it's just a different mode of perception. You yeah. see, but the the people who have that mode of perception are more normalized in our society, and empaths are pathologized, mm-hmm. and that is just totally wrong. Right. And that's the other thing. We talk about disorders, and you and I have had this conversation before. I think that everybody is so quick to grab for the meds if somebody isn't fitting the status quo that we are unfortunately medicating and over-medicating many people who are just highly intuitive or, empath- or empaths. And how do you, as a psychiatrist, walk that line of when somebody comes to you and says, ah, I just put my kid on meds, I want him to fit in? How do, you, how do you grapple with that? Well, I'm very discerning before I ever put somebody on meds. And unfortunately, a lot of people get sent to me from other doctors, you know, my private practice, who are on meds, mm-hmm. who have been medicated and diagnosed with panic disorder or, you know, mood swings or depression without also including the empath element. Right. And so the empaths come to me on these meds, and they're usually sick from the meds. Mm -hmm. And so I have to really assess what's going on there. And so if somebody came to me, let's say, not on meds but suffering who was an empath, I wouldn't put them on meds, you know, in, in the beginning. I would teach them some behavioral techniques and setting boundaries and visualization and meditation and learning how to say no and, and boundaries and you know, to be able to protect their energy more so they're not on sensory overload. And I want to say a lot of people who are addicts and alcoholics self-medicate and go into addictive behaviors because they're trying to treat their excessive empathy and sensory overload, which is just so painful. They're trying to numb their gifts or numb a memory or numb something else with other things. Yeah, I mean, I have a Facebook empath support community, and there's a woman who just shared today how she's just turning to alcohol and she can't help herself because she's in such pain from being overwhelmed. Mm. And that's the experience of an empath who doesn't have any strategies, and some turn to um, drugs and alcohol or addictive behaviors. And there's so many other options, but you need to know if that person is an empath and doing it versus not an empath because the treatment modalities are a bit different. 
In your book, Second Sight, you talk very openly about how you had some struggles with parents who didn't completely embrace what you were, your path, and then you go into medical school and you really started to find your groove, and you wind up going and, and learning about sort of different ways and meditating and expanding your intuition, and you also talk very openly about two near-death experiences that you had, one with a car crash and another where you were hit by a car yeah. as you are racing to a class. Explain to the audience what happened to you when, when you were, I mean, you were literally caught, I think, by angels. Or what do you, now looking back on it, explain what you think happened. Has it changed at all or is it still the exact same? I think I've had a lot of guidance and intervention in my life when I've been going through a destruct, down a destructive path. I've been given help. Right. You know, and I think those two examples are really powerful examples of how my life was saved by, I don't, I mean, I believe in angels, so it could be angels, but my experience of, of being slammed against a car with my body right. and being, you know, going somersaulting and then being thrown off the car, you know, I just went to a very, very safe place where everything was quiet. And everything was, was nurturing and still. So I didn't process, you know, all of the trauma as I was going through it. And then I landed on my feet, mm. which is pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, I had to deal with some of the body repercussions afterwards, the aches and pains, but I didn't even break anything. That's a miracle. And so you, you wonder what happens. You know, I mean, I, I feel like I have had help in my life to keep me on the right path so I could do my work, so I could lead my life in, mm -hmm. in, a, in a happy way. So I think everybody has this to a certain degree, but not everybody has it when they get into an accident. Some people are just you know, really, really traumatized. And I don't think that's to say they don't have angels, but, you know, it's a complex kind of situation, you know, in terms of what your spiritual lessons need to be. I had a conversation with someone recently about you know, why bad things happen to good people and all these things. And, yeah. and you know, some people are caught, like you get hit by a car and you come land on your feet without a broken bone. Knock uh, on wood. Right. Knock on wood. You know, a friend of mine went walking her dog and tripped and broke her leg. And so you have, do you believe that there are some lessons that we sign up for that we need to experience, like this person breaking a leg, to, I don't know, have compassion for those with broken bones? Is it something with their karma? What is your take on that from an intuitive perspective with the things when people, you know, claim to go, oh, bad things always happen to me? Do you think we call that in? Is it part of karma? Is it a little combination of all of it? It's life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just learning to accept life and roll with the lessons of life. I happen to have a very strong belief that we're here to learn spiritual lessons as difficult as some may be. Right. And some I may be protected from, like those two incidents of the accident, mm -hmm. you know, because I wasn't at that time meant to go through the trauma and the healing that comes from such an accident. You know, and there have been other times, like a few years ago, I was walking with my boyfriend and I accident at night and I accidentally stepped into a ditch and I broke my ankle. Right. And so, but, I mean, it was really clear to me that the lesson was I needed to let him take care of me and receive. And that's really hard for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was really hard to have him do all these things and to be in such an immobilized situation. But it was a, a level of trust in the relationship that developed. And would I have chosen to have broken my ankle? Of course not. Right. But I try and look at every experience as what I can learn from it, even though on a certain level, the level of the mind is like, oh, you know, something bad happened to me. But in order to go deeper with what life means, and especially if you're an empath, you don't want to be a victim. Right. That's the last thing you want to be. Because then you lose all your power if you're victimized. You want to try and stretch and see what you could learn from anything, mm -hmm. even if it's, <laughs> you know really horrible right no it's so true I, think, I know but it's hard but that's what i believe and so it's a very different way of living than let's say why do all these bad things happen to me in uh, second sight you talk about some of the studies that you were privy to in your medical research and in medical school that people were sort of combining the the science and the intuition to the listening audience that isn't familiar with any of these studies, are any of them top of mind at all, Judith, that you know of that have happened 
that people could just benefit from knowing either took place or are still taking place? Because I feel like there's always something going on and we just don't ever get privy to that knowledge. Well, I have a a section on my website with all the science articles on intuition and empathy and empath. Nice. So, yeah, so people can go to drjudithorlove.com and just peruse the traditional scientific journals. And there's one study I love on if you're making a a big decision, it's been proven that it's better to sleep on it and dream on it than make a snap decision just with your logical mind. Mm. And that, to me, is so powerful because, it, you know, the dream state is so intuitive. Mm-hmm. And you, you give up your ego when you sleep. And so, you know, to say I'm turning this decision over to my unconscious forces or whatever else that means that you connect with in, in your sleep, and then my decision will be better the next day, you know, that's really saying a lot. I know your take on this, but for the listeners who don't, what do you feel about past lives? Well, I personally believe in them. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you know? I, I don't want to be in a position to try and convince anybody. Sure, of it. sure. But do you think some of our uh, fears and phobias can be related to a trauma in a past life? Um, I, I do. Okay. I, I absolutely feel that everything that ever happened to our spirit, whether it's on the earth plane or anywhere else, affects who we are in human form. And so you might have an unexplainable you know, fear or phobia, let's say, of Spiders, and nothing ever happened to you with spiders, but maybe in a past life, a spider, you know, killed you. Right. (laughs) Right. No, it's true. And for people who are afraid of clowns, you know, who knows what happened when you were a child and went to the circus and you were scared by a clown. Or I have an unexplained fear of when I get on a balcony and I look over, I can't get too far I mean, I have to hug the building no matter where yeah, I, I am. I have I'm, that, too. I feel like I'm being pulled down to the ground. Yeah. it's and it's and Have you had past life regressions to un, unearth some of yours? You know, I haven't been that into past life regressions because in my meditations, I can get glimpses enough of what I know. I have enough to deal with in this life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there's something to be said about sometimes people hold on to it too much to make that story matter. I mean, I, I remember going through one and it really was good information for me to understand how my mom and I have traveled before and it, and it kind of gives me a compassionate look at the dynamic that we have now to have learned what happened in other lifetimes. But you don't dwell on it. You don't go, well, you know what? In 1846, you were a real bitch. I mean, it doesn't do you any good. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. And like, for instance, when I first started going out and speaking after Second Sight was published, mm-hmm. I had this unconscious fear that I was going to be killed mm. and that somebody either was going to shoot me or something horrible was going to happen. And so I had I had to go inside and really find out what that was about. Mm-hmm. And it felt to me it was from a past life where healers or seers were just, you know, hung or killed or sometimes burned or, you know, really suppressed in a major way that I was either picking up a past life or the collective repression of the seeing aspect of oneself. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it didn't have to do with the here and now. It had to do more with either the collective experience of this being squashed or a specific past life experience. And then I realized it was safe now. So, (laughs) you know, that really helped me because then I knew that I wasn't, you know, in jeopardy now, that Mm -hmm. it had more to do with these other things. Yeah, that's that's hugely helpful. I I had a very similar thing happen when I was um, doing my one woman show. I my throat closed up and it was really bizarre and I and I couldn't talk and I was supposed to get up and speak. So I went to somebody who somebody recommended to get a regression. Um, her name is Therese Rowley. She's here in Chicago and she's written a book called Mapping a New Reality and she's got a PhD and also. Um, you know, highly intuitive. And so she, without telling her what was going on, she deconstructed and found lifetime after lifetime after lifetime where I was hung or my throat was slashed for speaking out against the status quo, you know, for coming out with a different theory on what's going on. And so here I was coming out to talk about people like you, Judith, intuitives and mediums and psychics on the stage. And my, my soul was saying, don't, do it <laughs> right the collective right it was it was trying to protect it is. me mm-hmm. there's so many healers who have expressed the same fear to me mm-hmm. so it's a very common yeah. experience of speaking out now especially if you're an empath and and you're you're quiet you're in, i'm an introvert i'm shy so it doesn't make sense that i would be so articulate speaking in public mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm like so you know really quiet but when i get up in front of a crowd now that i have the freedom 
it just comes pouring out. That's right. And well, it also comes pouring out because you connect so much to your intuition. Do you ever feel like you just get straight downloads? Well, I never plan anything. Right, right. And that's perfect well, yeah, right there. I so I don't think about it too much because mm-hmm. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> right, absolutely. Just walk in and do it and let the flow yeah. come out. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the collective. And for those who are feeling the angst of the globe, I mean, my, my son wakes up every day and says, Mom, are we going to get hacked? You know, he's picking up on... Global fear, concerns. Fear, fear. So, what do we do? How do I? How do I guide him? How do we not pick up on the fears, uh, but still try to stay strong? Give our listeners a couple of um, tidbits so that they can go. Obviously, pick up the book for themselves. But just right now, while they're driving, any advice for them? Yeah, don't, I mean, people are very obsessed about the news, and they tend to, you know, look at cable news stations and the internet obsessively. Because it's very addictive. It's like a reality show. Right. You know, he's created it. So it's like a reality show. And so people, and there's an addictive quality to that. That's why they're so successful. Mm-hmm. And so you have to really limit the amount of time that you allow yourself to indulge in this craziness, get the information, but don't spend the bulk of your time, you know, going back and checking. Because the checking is addictive and obsessive. And, and use the time to... You know, really look at what's positive in your life and develop your sensitivities. Meditate to center yourself. Don't don't become seduced by all the fear and drama. Mm-hmm. It's very hard because they're very seductive. You have to learn how to breathe count to a count of six. Let's say let's say your mind is wandering and you're feeling drained and you're feeling in pain and you're feeling helpless. Whatever, mm-hmm. that's fine. Stop. Breathe. To a count of one, two, three, four, five, six. Hold it. Breathe down. One, two, three, four, five, six. And do that three times. Put your hand on your heart, which is your heart chakra, mm-hmm. and begin to focus on something you really love. It could be the ocean. It could be a lake. It could be clouds. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever you love, focus on it. And allow your heart to open and feel that heat and feel the tingling that can happen or even bliss or ecstasy that will ground you in where you need to be. You need to be in your heart. You don't need to be in your head, which is where fear resides. So when you feel yourselves caught up in fear, if you do that exercise in for six, hold for six, out for six, consciously putting your hand on your heart and your attention to your heart, that even just scientifically, it just calms your whole nervous system, doesn't it? Well, it stops the stress hormones and gets the endorphins flowing, which is what you want, the natural painkillers in the body, the blissful hormones. So you're taking control of your biology and brain chemistry through this simple exercise. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of my empath patients with panic attacks, I tell them the secret is slow down the breathing, and that slows down your heart rate, which cuts the panic response. Got it. And that's just an, that is a switch that will be shut down through the, the slowing down of the heartbeat. Yes, and you can do that consciously as long as you have the wherewithal to make that conscious shift in yourself as the panic is building. Or if you're starting to feel an ache in your heart when you're watching the news or a lump in your throat you know, you're watching this horrible, horrible mm-hmm. news, you don't want to go there. You want to recenter yourself and do what you can in your own circles. I really value the power, you know, say, of empaths and sensitive people coming out and loving one another in their own circles and doing good and being empathic. That will build the energy and create a tipping point away from this very non-empathic world we're living in. Also, the consciousness of when you wake up and start your day and, and when you end your day. You have a ritual for when you start your day. What does that entail? I do. I go to my sacred spot, and I put my hands together, and I pray, and I meditate. You know, just very for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Start. The first thing I wake up, I get out of bed and go right to my sacred space before I do anything else. Yeah, and that's a corner of a room, people. Don't think you have to have an entire suite or wing <laughs> or another room. That can be, I know a woman who literally at the foot of her bed, she has a Buddha statue. She sits down and kneels in front of the window, and three minutes she dedicates to that little corner. So it doesn't have to be big. No, mm-hmm. no, and you've been to my sacred space. Yes, it's perfect. It's, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. It has, yeah, it has windows, which mm-hmm. I've never had a sacred space with windows before. In my condo, I didn't have windows, but this is... 
know, beautiful one for me. And then at the end of the day, I go and I sit. And I have a kind of a, a lamb's wool rug that I sit on in front of my sacred space, so it's really kind of yummy and soft. Mm-hmm. So I like nice. I like sitting on it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I just I, I meditate more in the evenings for a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. to be able to center myself and reconnect with my heart because I want to be in the right place, you know, to sleep and also to wake up. And the mind is so easily seduced by fear or stress that what this does is that it allows me to recalibrate. And it's very useful for me. And I just want to stress to everyone, you don't have to do it. You don't have to meditate for 45 minutes. No. You know, there's in the book I talk about a three-minute reset meditation with the heart. But you have to get used to resetting yourself if you're an empath. You can't just go on from morning till night without anything. Right. Gosh, I wish I'd had the six in, six hold, and six out last night. We had a a meeting with a a choir. My my son is musical, and uh, he's decided to shift gears from piano to singing in this choir. So the gentleman came to um, meet and see if Britt could hold a tune and and Britt was great. He knocked it out of the park. I was so proud of him. I was like going oh. on, you know, I was just like weeping in the other room like, oh, he's doing it. So that the gentleman came and said, you know, I'd like to start you at this highest level. And I could see my son's face start to panic, but he sat there and he just listened. And so the guy was like, okay, we'll sign you up. And you have this concert, this concert, and this concert. And basically off to the races. And my son was going to go on the road with his choir. Oh, no, much too fast. <laughs> it was way too fast. And so at the end, you know, he's like, mom, could I talk to you? And it was just this kind of rush and flood of anxiety and fear and you know so great he was able to do that it was and I said okay you know what we're going to do we're going to ask him if we can go back a a few levels and start smaller and work our way up to that choir if that's what you feel like you want to do but let's just start at a lower level so you can get used to the system and the formula and to this and that and I could see his heart just start to calm down and you know I was like I hear you and I I totally understand why that would be scary and he was just so excited by how well you sang he wanted to hear he wanted to hear it more often so but we're going to start slow and we're going to do it this way and it was like uh, his body like his shoulders came from his ears down to like the regular level but I forget about the power of just like you mentioned earlier the heart math it is an incredible thing that our heart is what five times stronger than any other organ that we have and if we breathe into it, consciously putting breath into that area, that gets the endorphins flowing instead of the stress hormone, the cortisol, that takes over our nervous system. And we have that going so often, the cortisol, that we don't even remember what it's like to feel the endorphins. I know. People are in a, a frenzy a lot of the time and in a semi-state of panic walking around. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's really, really helpful. And, and what I love about the double-sided mirror, if you would share that one with the audience as well, for those who deal with the energy vampires on a daily basis, you can sit amongst an energy vampire and protect yourself. How does that look, Judith? Yeah, I don't I don't really know about or use the mirror mm-hmm. because I, I have particular feelings about mirrors and they're powerful and I don't, I don't want to use them myself. Okay, so just you, the light, the light protection then. Yeah, you mm-hmm. can, you know, visualize light all around your body about five inches from your skin Mm -hmm. and it could be white it could be pink it could be blue whatever color you really resonate with and feels protective to you and just feel that visualization of the light all around your body you have to believe in energy and the light you Mm -hmm. see that's the thing that they exist and what you're doing is manifesting it through your mind around you Mm -hmm. you know you have the capability of manifesting energetically a a shield around you and we all have that capacity but I'd like everyone who's maybe listening who doesn't think so to just try it because the mind might come in and say oh you know sure you know but but your experience will really trump the mind if Mm -hmm. you can do it and you can have your personal experience of oh my god I feel a lot better around that chronic talker or that drama queen when I do this you see so Mm -hmm. you really have to at least have the willingness to try it. True. For those who are totally skeptical and, you know, these brilliant intellectual people who analyze everything, but yet they won't experiment or play with this this world. And I think they're really doing themselves a disservice because they're not giving themselves a chance. They're like too grown up, you know, (laughs) they're too mature or too adult. And that can 
shouldn't be a detriment. You want to be able to play a little bit and experiment Mm -hmm. with things in this realm just to see if it's real. You don't have to take my word for it or your word. Just do it and and see. But if some people are so stuck on their minds, they just don't want to give anything else a chance because their minds are ruling them. Right. And also, too, for anyone out there that's got the hoarding mentality, you were the first person to awaken me to the beauty of gift gifting the universe, leaving a $5 bill in the bathroom on the floor or a $1 bill so that when someone finds that, they get that rush of, oh, I'm having such a lucky day. Yeah. You know, and that's literally putting it, I'm getting rid of a bunch of furniture that no longer works for me. You know, I just moved and I'm like, eh, that that one was me 20 years ago. So let's get rid of it. And I gave away a couch to a man who doesn't have a couch and couldn't afford a couch. And it felt great. And my friends were just like, why would you not try to sell it for 50 bucks or 25 bucks or 100 bucks? And I said, sometimes you have to give a little to get something. And that is so true, isn't it? You talk very openly about the abundance that by putting something out, you will get more back. Oh, yeah, but you, you, do, you don't do it for that reason. No, right. It's not like you're doing it in the hopes that you find a five the next day. It's just the energy of, of letting sort of like the pay it forward positive vibe. Yeah, you do it for the joy of it. Mm-hmm. It is such a blast for me, and I feel like I'm doing, you know, something really special when I just, you know, no one's looking, and I just leave a one or a five in a bathroom, and then I leave. <laughs> you know, it, it's so great. It just makes me laugh, and it makes me happy. And that whoever finds it, you know, most people get really happy. Some people, you know, get really over obsessive and want to return it to the store owner and say somebody <laughs> lost it. You know? Right. There's, there's a great episode in this show called The Middle where Sue, the daughter, you know, accidentally bumps into a car when she's backing up, and she didn't even leave a mark, but she leaves a note on the car, (laughs) and then she doesn't hear from them, so she leaves another note. She must have left seven notes, and the guy finally (laughs) called and said, I just wanted to meet the person who wanted to leave this many notes. (laughs) You're like the most honest person I've ever met, right? And that's the thing. It's, it's, It's just by being that person, you are kind of putting out a vibe of, of higher energy instead of low and fear. And that's what we need to be is high and in the in the resonance of love instead of the vibration of fear. Well, that's what I suggest. And mm-hmm. when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to look back on all the fears you had necessarily of not working enough, not making enough money. You're going to look back on all the loving experiences. That's what I've seen with people about to pass over. You're going to want to you know, look back on, wow, that felt so good to be with my spouse then. We had such a beautiful time. You know, or I was with my grandchildren, you know, or, oh, my God, I wasn't with my grandchildren. Right, right. That, that's what you think about in terms of priorities. So I hope everybody, empaths, sensitive people, everyone could set those priorities in your life now so you don't miss out. Do you think we have, I've interviewed a lot of people who talk to, you know, the other side, and they, they believe that when we pass over, we have a life review and we sort of feel everything that we put out. Is that your belief as well? I kind of do, yeah. Yeah. So imagine that, everyone, while you're listening. The movie that you want to watch when you get over there. Do you want to watch a movie of hoarding or do you want to watch a movie of loving and and the relationships that you have? It's not about the stuff. You can't take the stuff with you. It's about the experiences that you have and those heart connections. I I try to think about that a lot because, um, you know, a lot of change is going on in my life. and, And one can think of some of these things as, oh, wait, that's no longer there. That's a loss. But really, it can be a great gift to have a new template and a new energy and a new flow going in a new direction. It can be very freeing. Absolutely. And if you're an empath and you're suffering right now, you know, that can change because sometimes when you're suffering, this kind of talk and this kind of conversation seems out of reach. Right. Right. You know, it can. Right. And so... You know, empaths who are suffering or, you know, really just exhausted, if you're just exhausted from life or mm-hmm. if you're in a chronic state of anxiety, um, you can begin to do these things very slowly. I'm a big believer in slow integration of, of new techniques. Just what you said, six seconds in, six seconds hold, six seconds out. If you are overwhelmed, if you're in a panic attack, start with six seconds. And go from there. Maybe you'll, wake your, you'll work your way up to three minutes. One can hope. <laughs> yes, and, and to just know there's always hope. And mm-hmm. that my 
my mission now is to help people embrace their sensitivities because when you feel comfortable with, let's say, your ability to sense other people and you're not absorbing their energy, you have the power behind you. Yeah. You know, that's the power of love and that's the power of empathy. Empathy to me is a form of intuition because you're reaching out with your heart to feel what's happening. I mean, literally, there's something in you that reaches out to another human being or animal or whatever you're reaching, or plant, whatever you're reaching out to. And you're expanding your heart to be able to resonate with another being. Absolutely. And this is really powerful, and I think it needs to be dissected and understood for what it is. But this, I mean, to me, this is what will save the world. Yeah. You can't get, you can't, empathy doesn't always work in getting someone to change their mind about something, but it's the only chance we have in creating change. That's if you don't huge. have empathy, mm-hmm. it's very hard to make advances just with the mind. It has to be a mind-heart connection that and, will create true change. And that's, that's what's been think. missing, the mind-heart connection, like you yeah. say. We have to have both. Yeah, and a lot of people who are intellectuals and brilliant and, you know, think, oh, I'm not going to get too soft, you know, getting into intuition or empathy. But that's I'm not suggesting they give up the sharpness of their mind. No. I'm suggesting that they add the power of their hearts and empathy to the sharpness of their mind. That yeah. they could do both at once, and that is more powerful than the mind alone. Mind, heart, body, it's a triple threat. Judith Orloff, The Empath Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive People. It's in bookstores everywhere now. Dr. Judith Orloff, D-R, Judith Orloff is spelled O-R-L-O-F-F dot com. You can find Judith on Twitter, on Facebook, The Empath Community also on Facebook. Thank you, Judith, for doing what you do. And I look forward to many more conversations and hearing about how we can increase um, this vibe of empathy into our universe to help shift things in the right direction. Oh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Stay spiritual, everybody. I'm Jen Weigel at jenweigel.com, and I'm spiritual, damn it. 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 Damn it.